OK, thanks for staying for the last talk of the conference. Um, I'm going to be talking about something I call narrative dungeon generation or narrative-based dungeon generation. This was the slide I put up uh, yesterday. It's basically got some of the projects I've worked on and released. Um, uh, there's some links at the bottom if you'd like to follow up, but I went through it yesterday, so I won't go through it again. Only thing to say, I'll be talking a little bit about this game, a seven-day game jam game I did in 2014. So if you follow an online tutorial on how to design and program a roguelike, you'll go through a process, something a little bit like this, in order to build your dungeons. And this is the process I've used in pretty much all of my games. So you pick a dungeon generating algorithm off the internet that you think looks cool. So here's one, which you may recognize from my talk yesterday, which makes rooms and exceptionally unpleasantly long corridors. You think, wow, OK, I fancy a game all about long corridors. I'm going to pick that one. You set some reasonable parameters, you know, corridor equals long or whatever, and you, you build a random map. OK, that's pretty good going. So that's a, although I like corridors, it's not quite the same if I don't have some monsters and treasure. So what am I going to do? I'm going to generate some monsters and treasure. This is a monster in my parlance, and there's some treasure. And I'm going to sprinkle them throughout my map. And OK, maybe I'll try and keep the monsters slightly separate to each other, so they're kind of distributed well around. And maybe I'll put a treasure near the monster or something. And maybe I'll include a pre-built vault, which I made by hand, which is you know some sort of trap or something. But Basically, what I've done is I've got a dungeon generating algorithm to build me a map, and then I put interesting things in it. Um, and that's how most games I see work. And to be honest, there's nothing wrong with it. It does work. That's how I've done it. But I'd like to challenge for um, a next generation of game that that's the right way to go about generating dungeons and placing content. So I think uh, a good game is based on telling a story, just as we saw in the last talk. So I would say, don't just generate your maps and put them full of stuff. Think, first of all, about the story you want to tell. So maybe you've got a global narrative for your game. Um, my game, it's about setting a self-destruct button and fleeing to an escape pod. And while I'm doing that, there's probably a few local narratives I run into, like a monster pat uh, level patrolled by monsters who go around in a, in a circle. But what I'm saying is, let's build the game around those narratives, and let's build the levels around the narratives. Let's not get a random level design and then try and stick our narrative in there. Okay? But that is, I think, a much more challenging thing to do. So let's think about breaking down one of these, um, or a couple of these narratives into individual stages to give us some idea of how we need to structure our game. So let's say, we want to um, blow up our space station and escape to the escape pods. Maybe the first thing we have to do is to override the self-destruct safeties in the computer core. And maybe I do that in a traditional way of computer games by blowing shit up. So I have to blow the computer cores up first. Then maybe with the safeties off, I go down to a reactor level and you know, cut a red wire and activate a, a self-destruct function. So that's going to be probably on an engineering level. I'm, I think it might be a radiation zone to protect a reactor, and it's defended by some sort of scary patrolling mechanical robots. And finally, it's all set up to go, but I need to press a big red button on the bridge. But um, So let's say that's, that big red button is right in the middle of a load of panels, as you'd imagine in your sort of sci-fi picture. It's on the topmost level of my space station. It's defended by the captain or what's left of him as he turned into some sort of horrible cyborg. Finally, done all that, I need to run down to the escape pods. And they've got to be some distance from the bridge to give me that sort of narrative feeling I want of running against, you know, maybe a time limit. And I have to fight through perhaps a set of automated defenses or some last ditch defense by the um, station security or, or something like that. And so you break, start breaking down your, your narrative um, into these kind of uh, different narrative stages. And it gives you some idea of how you might start building a, a game building levels um, in order to meet this narrative. Clearly, I need an a engineering level with radiation and mech bots. I need a bridge, I need an escape pod level, and some idea of a relationship between them. 
one thing to say is if we're building a conventional game, we'd expect um, the difficulty to increase as our character makes progress and as our character picks up useful items, weapons. So we'd expect that going to the computer core would be an easier thing to do than going to the reactor, going to a bridge, and maybe the most difficult end game part is running to the escape pods. Now, if you're writing a game which doesn't really have a difficulty um, ramp, that might not be appropriate, but in most roguelikes you get better um, and more capable as you move along, but you want to keep the challenge up. So that's maybe part of our overall story, but there could just be a few intermediate levels um, where we just want to put in a bit of local color. So we're going to say, OK, this is an intermediate level. It's not really part of the main quest, or maybe only one small part of the level is involved in the main quest. But the rest of it has really nasty patrolling monsters. So that's going to influence my level design. Um, the level I showed at the beginning might be pretty good, because I need a level that's got a lot of loops, because these monsters are going to go on a, on a big circuit. And I want to make sure that the player has to traverse those loops to get to any key parts of the level. I don't want these loops to be off to one side with monsters just walking around for no reason. So again, it's guiding the level design that we want based on our, our narratives. Also, I need to actually place my patrol bots on patrol. And perhaps I've decided they have hardened armor. But if you're giving something, an obstacle like that to the player, it's hard to shoot them with your normal gun, you're probably going to want to place some armor-piercing bullets, maybe on a, a separate branch on the level, um, and maybe in a trapped locker. So again, every part of the dungeon, it's not purely random. It's being guided by a little mini story, a mini narrative that we have, um, we want the player to experience, we want the player to remember when they've done that level. So even my global narrative there is probably not the whole story. There's probably something in this, that happened in this space station that made me think I wanted to press the self-destruct. Maybe I discovered a, a captain's log saying he'd, been, he'd gone mad or, or something like that. So a fully procedural game storyline, which is what I'm trying to aim towards and which I think the previous um, talk sort of alluded to as well, might contain one of several global narratives. Now, what I'm thinking about is that um, there's perhaps a library of global narratives. Maybe the first part is breaking into the captain's cabin, or maybe it's breaking the antennae. Um, and after that, maybe it's setting the self-destruct and escaping, or maybe it's defeating the master robot. And maybe I take some combination of these, and that means I get a complete procedural storyline um, for, for, my, for my game made up of different parts. And then to increase the sort of degree of diversity, the amount of procedural generation further, I mix in some local narratives, patrolling monsters. Maybe on one level, there's a robot construction shop I need to blow up to stop the robots being um, built. There's an armory to unlock, or a multi-part weapon, which has various parts around the dungeon, which I need to, to find before I, I do a final encounter. So really, the question is, if I want to build a game out of narrative storylines, and I start with the storylines and then build a game around that, how can I do that procedurally? How can I do that automatically? Because I could handcraft one of these, or I could handcraft two of these, but when I've got 10 or 20 of them which are semi-handcrafted, and I'm expecting the game to put them together in some order that works, how can we go about doing that? So I'll show you a little bit about my attempts to do that so far. I wouldn't claim to have, to have got there. Before I do that, one thing to mention is that narratives can have different types of dependencies. So I'll just define a couple of terms here. A narrative, narratively dependent um, set of tasks, they're like the tasks I showed you in the previous slides. The order of a task is specified by the narrative. You press the self-destruct button first, and then you flee to the escape pod. Not much point doing it the other way around. There's something else, though, called a, what I call a topologically dependent uh, topological dependency between two narratives. Let's say the self-destruct button's on the bridge, but a bridge is locked, and the key is in the captain's cabin on a different deck. Now, there's a self-destruct story in there, but there's also a story that um, locks a bridge room. The fact that these two stories are going on at the same time mean there's a dependency between them. I have to unlock the bridge before I can get to the self-destruct button, but they're not necessarily part of the same narrative. Um, and so that's why they're, they're sort of dependent because of where they're located rather than being part of the same narrative. And finally, you've got basically independent narratives. There's an armory on a level and there's a key. It doesn't really 
link into any larger quest. It's just there by itself. So this is where I'll bring in a real example. So my um, Game Jam 7 Day RL game from 2014, Trauma RL, is about running around a space station, pressing escape buttons and blowing up reactors and stuff. Um, and so it's an example of where we had a fixed narrative. So it's always the same. I'll show you in a sec. But randomized elements. So the reactor might be in a different place. Um, the captain's cabin might be a different place. The guards in the captain's cabin might be different. But you're always going to a captain's cabin. And you're always going to react. And you're always going to escape. So we need to move beyond this kind of fixed narrative to a random selection of narratives. So here's a rather simplified version of the quest um, that's actually in this game. And I'll just take, although it, I apologize, it looks rather complicated, I'll take you through a, a couple of it, um, examples here, and you'll get some idea of what I'm talking about when I say narrative and topological dependencies. So you start at the start, and you have to destroy a number of cameras on a medical level in order to unlock an elevator that basically allows you to go to the rest of the game. However, independently of that, there's an armory on the level. You can open an armory, find an armory key, and open an armory. So we've got a couple of narratives here. There's a medical level narrative about getting off the medical level. And there's an armory narrative. And those two are pretty much independent of each other. I don't need to get off the medical level to access the metal armory. Once I've opened up the medical elevator, um, there's a couple of different routes. There's another armory I can go and deal with. There's a quest about finding a bridge key, which unlocks a bridge right down here. There's a quest about finding an environmental suit and getting into an arcology, which is full of like evil viruses. Um, but also a quest about finding an antennae and breaking it to unlock a security lock here. Finally, once you've done all that, you've got the computer core, reactor, escape quest that I kind of referred to earlier. So within each quest, you've got a number of stages. But you can see there's a number of sort of complicated dependencies um, between the quests as well. And a number of these are based on, on locking doors. So you can't do your escape narrative until you've unlocked the computer core, which is dependent on the arcology, which is dependent on the transmitter narrative. And you can't do any of that until you've got off the first medical level. Um, it's kind of a subtle difference, but perhaps as I go on a, a little, you'll, you'll kind of see why even unrelated quests, if we put them in the same place, can end up being dependent on each other. So as I say, the challenge here for me is to move from a fixed narrative, which I've done in the past with random elements, to a game which can pick a random selection of narratives, put them together, and make, I hope, a much more interesting experience where you're doing a set of tasks that you've probably never done before, or at least never done in that order. There's a number of challenges here. We want to make sure that narratives are compatible with each other. We want to make sure the whole game has a sort of logical flow. And as I say, the difficulty scales sensibly. We don't want the hardest thing at the beginning and the easiest thing at the end. So I'll take you through the way my, what I've called my narrative pipeline works. So I start off with a narrative catalog, and that contains sort of large chunks of narrative, like my self-destruct kind of quest, um, my antenna quest, and small narratives as well. So here I've taken the escape narrative as an example. It's a random narrative which locks off a bridge, let's say, and it's a random, random narrative. So sorry, the escape narrative I've explained already, and a couple of local narratives, one that randomly locks a bridge, and one that randomly locks a start level and several sort of random local narratives um, for the rest of the game. So you, the computer randomly selects, or guidedly randomly selects these narratives. And for each, each narrative then has a turn to say, well, I need a particular type of and particular number of levels. I need to give you some information about how difficult they are. And I need to say what I need on those levels. So this is all about letting the narrative drive the level design, not the other way around. So the escape narrative says, look, I want an escape pod level, a bridge level, a reactor level, and a computer core level, because those are important for my narrative. And the bridge ought to be harder, or at least as hard, as a reactor, which ought to be harder, or at least as, as hard, as a computer core level. Within the bridge level, there must be some sort of central vault. The reactor must have a big loop for my patrol and a central vault for my button. And the computer core must have multiple rooms with computers in them. <coughs> 
and the escape pod must have area, an area at the end, a vault at the end for the escape pods to go in. So just to reiterate, the narratives here, each one is going in and saying, these are my list of demands for the level generation code. So it's narrative first. The narratives specify what they need, and the level generator is meant to try and satisfy that. Here's an example of um, the way the levels work in that particular game. You start off on a medical level. You then go to a sort of atrium or sort of transport level um, where you can go to a number of other different areas. And randomly, the ordering of the levels is in a tree. But in this case, you see you go from lower atrium to the science level to a storage level on the flight deck. Or you can go to the reactor directly from here. And that um, tree for the levels changes each time. But the question is, how do I ensure that the tree I'm building honors the difficulties um, of the levels? So I'll tell you the way I do it. I use an algorithm called a topological sort. So you may have come across this algorithm if you're the kind of person who comes across algorithms, because it's the same algorithm people use in project management to ensure that you do tasks um, earlier tasks before later tasks. So you buy the car before you hire the driver and before you run the taxi company. And very briefly, the way it works is each narrative registers a relationship between the difficulties of its levels. So a medical narrative might say, our medical level is easier from the lower atrium level. The escape narrative might say, the computer core, then the um, um, reactor, then the bridge, then the flight deck. And as you keep adding different narratives, they keep putting their um, level demands in terms of difficulty into this graph. And at the end, you use this topological sort algorithm, which basically says, give me a listing of the levels in an order, which never means you need to go to a more difficult level first and an easier difficulty level afterwards. And that influences in the algorithm I use to build this tree. So that, for example, in this example, it's not particularly exciting, but you can see that the bridge, the reactor, um, and the computer core are arranged in such a way that you don't need to go for a more difficult one to get to an easier one. Okay, And that's the same for every other quest in the game as well. They all contribute to building this big graph. Okay, so once I've basically figured out which order the levels are going to be in, so they can support my narrative, I now need to construct each level um, honoring the requirements. And if you came to my talk yesterday, you'll know why I got interested in the idea of being able to just say to a neural network, build me a level with a big loop and some vaults, because that's what my narratives are telling me I need. So I'm struggling with this a little bit at the moment. Um, I'm trying to use some of the principles of what's called cyclic level design, which was a sort of series of my algorithm ideas proposed by um, Doris Jormans, and I've got uh, sorry, Joris Dormans, I've got a link there. Broadly, what I do is, this is a level I've created automatically. I start by making, for example, a couple of loops. Um, that gives me a structure to the rooms in the level and the connections between them. And then I have an algorithm which takes an appropriate template and fits it onto a grid with each of these connectivities. So, for example, this is a corridor because it's got an entrance and output. This is like a T-junction, because it has three entries. Um, and if you had one with four, it would be a crossroads. So basically, the algorithm works through the graph and then turns that into a level. The tricky thing here, of course, is the graph isn't on a sort of Euclidean grid, whereas a level that we want actually needs to have rooms that don't overlap. So it's kind of a, a difficulty there. The way I get around it at the moment is quite naive in so much as it uses a standard grid where I can be guaranteed that any node um, setup can be, can be represented, but it somewhat limits the amount of flexibility I have in my level design. And if you look at, I'll come on a bit to the cyclic level design, which has been implemented in a game, if you look closely at that game, I think he does a slightly similar thing. Right, so what have we got now? We've got a series of levels with connections between them, but on over difficulties um, of the levels. We've got levels which are blank templates but contain all of the features that my narratives want. So now I go through the narratives one by one and I can say, look, here's your level, here's the loop you wanted. Go place your monsters, place your treasure, place your clues, place your keys, place your locked doors. And I have another algorithm to ensure we don't have any deadlocks. But basically, it will go through all of the um, narratives and they'll all build what they want 
um, into the different levels. And I'll end up at the end of the day with a set of levels which um, you can play through each of these narratives in a sensible way. What I then do, obviously, that covers um, quite a lot of the content of the game, but there's probably going to be some empty rooms as well. So I then do more traditional kind of paths of any empty rooms. I place random monsters, treasures, locked doors, etc. Again, based on the level difficulty which I, which I have. And you can't see it very well, but the code I use generates these kind of complicated structures which show how every room in the dungeon is connected to every other and what you can expect to find in all of them. Because you can imagine debugging this is kind of tricky, but with this kind of representation that comes out as a PDF, I can quickly work out that where the keys are, where the doors are, etc., and I can check that the um, sort of narrative flow is, is reasonable and everything isn't crammed in one corner. So it's sort of a nice abstraction for checking that this is working. So what challenges do I have? Well, the, right at the start, I talked about selecting different narratives that work well with each other. I don't really have a, a clever way of doing that at the moment. I have sort of relatively simple, okay, take one of these narratives, which I know are good, one of these narratives and one of these narratives. So that might give you, you know, 20 or 50 different combinations of narratives, which I know work well, but it's still a bit handcrafted. It's not, the machine doesn't really have any parameters it can use to decide that things work well together. As I say, I don't have a great way of creating nice level designs at the moment, honoring these requirements for loops and vaults, etc. cetera. Um, I, my ones are, although they look okay, they're um, a little bit um, samey. And to be honest, it's just a lot of code to write. Um, compared to a normal kind of dungeon generator, going through this degree of, of complexity is quite a lot of overhead when you're writing a game. So I would highly recommend if you want to do this, make it, make it the conceit of your game. It's not really something that sort of just hangs on the side. If you're, if you're taking on a challenge like this, it's got to be something that's really important to the game. That is until we perhaps see more libraries that can that do these kind of things. So I've been working on these kind of, this kind of dungeon generation for a long time, as anyone who knows me and who's been to these um, conferences before will know. But I mentioned this guy, Dormans. He came out with a game. He's an academic from Holland. but He came out with this game, Unexplored, um, last year which actually puts in place quite a lot of the things I've, I've described. Now, he's done a, a number of talks and has a couple of papers. It doesn't seem to be exactly, it doesn't go about exactly the same way as me, but I think he has sort of the same end goal in mind. How can I generate dungeons that, that tell a story randomly rather than random dungeons that have a story thrust into it? So I'd highly recommend you check out this game. It's very... um. The devs are extremely responsive, I found. It's real-time and Twitch-based, so I don't really like it. Um, I'd like it more if it's turn-based, but it's certainly a, it's fascinating in terms of, of level design. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? OK, at the back. Yeah, so the question is, would I like to combine this with a neural network-based dungeon gen I mentioned? And the answer is absolutely yes. To be honest, I think the neural network gen, although it's a nice idea, is a little way off from the future. I can do this not using neural networks, and that's probably the most pragmatic way for now. It's just, as I say, quite a time overhead, so I'm not quite as far along as I would, I would like. But the wider question is interesting. Can we use neural networks more widely to start building narratives for us? and um, creating games that are built from procedural narratives. And I think that's, that's a very interesting line of research. Yeah, so I think the question was, um, Sort of what are the challenges there? Is it to do with the processing speed of neural networks? Um, I think, in general, the neural networks, um, although they're relatively computationally expensive, when they create levels, are actually quite fast and not too memory intensive. Um, I think the challenge really is 
training a neural network to understand how to build a narrative. Um, that's, that's something which, um, there is, again, I'm no expert, but I've certainly seen neural networks used to generate um, little parts of text, um, and indeed neural networks to understand the relationships between simple stories. If Bob goes to the shop and leaves his wallet there and comes home, where is the wallet? A well, neural network can answer those kind of questions. So it's not inconceivable that neural networks could start building short procedural narratives um, and then implementing them in games. Darren. Okay, so the question was, um, will a player actually see value from this, obvious value, if it's all happening behind the scenes, or does it just turn into a very long loading screen before the start of the game? And can we perhaps materialize this, this dungeon-making AI um, as something in the game? It's, it's certainly interesting. Yeah? First think of a sort of Left 4 Dead style AI directors, who obviously, in a very simple way, because they can't alter the map geometry, um, change the game to make it that more fun uh, experience in real time. And I quite like the idea of an evil dungeon master who keeps throwing stuff in front of you as, a, as an evil AI. If you think about System Shock, which is absolutely my inspiration for making my sci-fi roguelikes, then it's all about a malevolent AI. So well, hopefully the dungeon generator AI isn't really meant to be malevolent, but it certainly puts traps and monsters in front of humans, so it, it probably must be. So yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, I think with reference to a previous talk as well, when you've got a lot of cleverness going into something, you probably do want the um, user to be aware of it. And you want, if there's a way of interacting with it, you want that feedback to be, to be quite obvious. So I, I, do, I do agree that would be an interesting thing to follow up. Yeah, so um, for the record, Darren's, Darren's follow-up was that he's seen um, players misinterpret clever NPC AI as, as random and misinterpret random AI as, as clever. Um, so yeah, all, all valid points. Um, I'm trying to do something here which I think is pretty understandable, which is can I make the narrative structure of the game different each time but still make it a fun game? I think that is something which um, the player would understand after playing it for a few times. Was there a question at the back? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So the question was, um, is there a, a sort of an existing framework or philosophical framework of, of stories like the hero's journey which could influence um, this sort of idea of narrative dungeon generation? I do think it's really interesting. I'm kind of coming at this from the bottom up. It's a really nuts and bolts approach. It's lots of graphs and lots of algorithms. What I, as I alluded to earlier, I haven't really done is think much about the, the way that we select different narratives together. And I think you know, speaking to that point, perhaps um, that would certainly influence the n narratives I wrote, which the thing would pick from, and perhaps a way of parameterizing those narratives such that the computer could make sensible decisions. So yeah, it's certainly something I'd want to look into. <laughs> 
Okay, so the question was started with a comment that um, in many roguelikes, many players spend most of the time learning and dying on D1. Um, therefore, isn't there a risk if you spend a lot of time making D2 to 26 really clever um, that users are only going to see a small amount of your, your content? So I think it's fair enough. I don't think it's a problem that's exclusive to you know, the kind of algorithms I'm describing here. Um, in my game, actually, it's very hard to die on D1, so you almost always do CD2. But um, on on a wider basis, I think what perhaps the the nice thing about having a very varied narrative structure is that every game can be quite narratively different. Therefore, I feel less less um, compulsion to make my game very difficult so that people have to spend a lot of time learning all the tricks in order to make progress. Because the game is going to hopefully be so, so different each time, I don't mind if on your first attempt you get halfway through the game, and on your second attempt you get all the way through the game, because actually playing the game should be a reward in itself, even without having to bang your head against a, uh, a very hard learning curve. Okay, thanks for your time, everyone.